gap, standing for Jesus. Standing in the gap for family and friends. Standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in. Standing in the gap, standing for Jesus. Standing in the gap for family and friends. Standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in. Studying to show ourselves approved, rightly defying the word of truth. Increasing our faith to envision our freedom, so we all can glorify our God. Standing in the gap. Standing for Jesus, standing in the gap for family and friends, standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in, make it in, make it in, make it in. Want to hear him say good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, Say good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, Hear him to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, Good and good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, Hear him to the joy of the Lord. Of the Lord, joy of the Lord. Lord, joy of the Lord. Of the Lord. All right, good morning. My name is Art Harmon, and welcome to our Christian ministry that we call Standing in the Gap USA. We call it Standing in the Gap USA because the world and and uh, 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 evil has created a gap between God and his people where the people no longer rely on the word of God. And God is looking for those who have, have the faith and the strength of faith to stand in that gap on his word and draw his people back to him. He's looking for those who are willing. And and uh, we have decided that we're going to stand in the gap. And we stand on that word of God. We stand on the truth. And that's what this ministry is all about. And we uh, are presently within a uh, study that we call the Constitution and the Bible to show the world that the eternal word of God is superior to the Constitution. And some people want to rely on the Constitution. They, they, their whole life is based upon what they feel the Constitution says, and they forget about or ignore what God's word says. And that's dangerous, and there are consequences for doing that. Before we get into our study that we're working on at this time, as always, we start out with a prayer. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you, Father. You brought us safely back from, from halfway around the world, actually, to, to come back here and to profess your eternal word. So, Father, we want to thank you for that hedge of protection that you put around us, the hedge of protection you put around those who are able to join us live, Father, and those that will review this at a, at a later time. We ask that you open our hearts and open our, our minds, Father, and fill it with your word, Father. We ask all these things in your name and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 As I said, we uh, this is our Christian ministry. I I do the teaching here, and uh, but the hard work is done by my collaborator, the one that stands with me all through through all all the um, uh, uh, technical parts of this, and who 
does, I call it the heavy lifting of keeping us on the air and keeping us uh, going. We sometimes have, have little glitches and things like that, and there um, things happen. But God is uh, God is our, our our guide. God is our strength. God is our leader. So regardless of all the glitches that are thrown in our way, Father, we keep going. And so we want to thank thank God for that. But I do want to introduce you to that one, that one that uh, stands stands by my side at all times. She may be in the background, but without her, we would not be able to to uh, come to you each week with the Word of God, and that is my wife, Marvel. Marvel. Well, I am coming from a different direction today. Good morning, Saints. Uh, first of all, I want to let you know that. In the chat box, there is a link so that you can uh, download today's outline number three. We do not have the live today. And the reason for that is I lost my iPad on the plane. So we're in the process of getting a new one and being able to get that back together. But for now, you just have to chat, chat, chat in the box. Ask all your questions. Make all your comments. And... We're so glad to be back home from the Philippines. I also want to tell you, I'm Marvel Gentry Harmon on Facebook. If you want to see some great pictures and some great videos from the Philippines, check me out over there. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Thank you. We had a we had a heck of a trip all the way around the world. What was that? That flight on the way was like 13 <laughs> hours or something? 13 and a half hours was one leg, but all together it was like, 28 hours of travel with the uh, layovers in between. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you what, the trip was worth it, but that was a long ride. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, in any event, we're here. We're back. And we're ready to uh, proceed with the Word of God. We've been uh, in this Constitution and the Bible. And uh, we've... Uh, We've, we've got a lot that we've been able to talk about. We're presently talking about the indigenous people of this country, how the Constitution, the, uh, the words in the Constitution, the interpretation of the Constitution, the um, implementation of the Constitution, and all that, how that has uh, affected in, uh, 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 the indigenous people and, and, and this country. And so, um, it's very interesting. It's very an in, in-depth in study, and we're going to jump right into it uh, uh, soon. <laughs> the reason I say soon is because I always like to start out by explaining or trying to explain that we, we are in the midst of what's called spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare is a, a warfare for your eternal soul, and the battle is going on, and we uh, have to be able to know how to, how to fight it, how to, what weapons we have to use in this warfare because, as we always say, the bombs and the grenades and the sidewinders and the F-15, F-16 fighters and all that don't do you a bit of good in this warfare. You need to know what weapons you can use. You need to know how to fight. And you use the Word of God. And that is what we're standing on in the gap, is the Word of God. But most, a lot of people don't understand that. So we have to explain that, yes, you are in spiritual warfare. We refer you to Ephesians 6.12, as always, which clearly states for our struggle. is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And basically, the interpretation is that we're in a, a battle. We're in warfare that comes from the spiritual world. We deal in the physical world against physical enemies, but those physical enemies and consequences are, are controlled by the evil in the spirit world. It begins there. And if you, and if you uh, direct your, your battle against, just against flesh and blood, then you're not fighting the true enemy. The true enemy is controlling those in the spiritual world just like a puppet master. And so we want you to understand that we're in spiritual warfare. 
And we have to understand that it is warfare. It is warfare. And warfare means warfare. Understand that this means war. Got joy in my soul. God is in control. Like I say to know my trail. But I'm singing all is well. He's attacking every day. But I'm watching while I pray. No matter the attack, I won't turn back. This means war. This means war. And now that we've got that all packed away and, and uh, we understand that, we can move forward. Because we know we're in warfare. And it's a whole different, different uh, fight. When it's spiritual warfare. All right. Now, as I said, this is a, a study. We call it the Constitution versus the Bible, really. But the first thing we want to introduce you to in this uh, study when we when we started out is your understanding of that the eternal word, the eternal word of God in the Bible. He's left us the eternal word of God. And that while we look at a physical uh, book, the eternal word is spiritual also. What do you mean? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So when you see the eternal word, you're talking about Jesus. If you can look through the physical and see the spiritual, that's Jesus talking to us. Jesus is the eternal word and this this entire study is is built upon those who may not believe that the eternal word is means just that it is the word and it is superior to all other uh, words and the eternal word of God is superior to the Constitution of the United States it's superior to the Declaration of Independence, superior to the uh, uh, opinions of the Supreme Court, superior to the actions of the uh, executive branch of our government, and superior to the to the actions and the laws that are passed by the legislative uh, 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 branch of our government, and the silly acts that uh, that uh, people do. If you've been following the news, you know that that. Uh, they do a lot of things that make no sense at all. And then they want to control people's minds when they do it. And unfortunately, they do a pretty good job of that. And unfortunately, that is creating a bigger and bigger gap. Mm. Now, we want you to know how to um, compare the actions of, of this, this world against the Word of God or in light of the Word of God, and we ask you to compare what God says we should do and, uh, with what we actually do and see if we stand up to the standard that God has presented. The standard that God has presented is uh, contained in Micah 6 8. And I've done a little, little studying on Michael 6 8 too, because I bring that up all the time so people should actually have committed all this to memory. <laughs> Micah 6 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly? Love mercy and walk humbly with your God. The research I've done on it recently has, because uh, there's always some uh, disagreement as to what clear words mean, I guess. Um, and there's some people say, okay, well, um, people are using this with in their social um, uh, on their social platforms and in their things they're doing and um, uh, out in the world like Black Lives Matter and, and all that kind of thing. And they're they're using Micah six eight. And they're not using it right. They're taking it out of context and all that. And uh, they say uh, if you look into the context of Micah six eight, you'll find that what God is talking about is um, um, the procedure that men should do when they're trying, men as the government or as the uh, legislature, as the uh, as the, uh, judiciary, should do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. And, and if you take it out of that uh, context, you're taking it out of context. And uh, 
I thought about that and I said, well, wait a minute. What what Micah 6, 8 is saying is is what God is all about. And whether that's while you're in a, 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 a judge in a courtroom or you're a legislature, a, 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 a legislator in the Congress trying to figure out what laws to pass and all that, um, it's still God's word as to what is good, regardless. And it's this is how you should act at all times. You should do justice. You should love mercy and walk humbly with your God. And, and walking humbly with your God basically means that as you are walking with God, you are walking for God and not for yourself. That's what that means. Walk humbly with God. A lot of people want to walk, call themselves walking with God and they're doing it for themselves. That's not, that's not what God wants. He wants you to honor Him, not yourself. That's what walk humbly with God means. And we use this as a standard that we hold uh, against the actions of, of, of this world. And, and, um, and if, you don't, if you don't measure up, then you, you uh, should understand that you're not measuring up to the word of God. So the question is, does this country, this United States, this Constitution, the the uh, opinions of the Supreme Court, the uh, laws that are passed, the uh, they'll, do those stand up to what God expects of us? Because He's shown us what He expects of us. All right, and we'll, we'll we will be revisiting Micah six eight uh, several times as we go through this study because um, we have to understand what is superior. We have to understand. What is eternal? Because no matter how long the United States has been here and its government and all that, it's not eternal. And as we've seen, we've gone through, through slavery. Now we're we're dealing with the indigenous people of this country. We have to understand what God expects of us. What God expects of us. So that's what we're we're going to measure up. But we want to we want to always. Uh, measure it with what's going on today and uh, the things that are happening in today's world. We have a, seg uh, a segment that we call the Gap News. Gap News. And we, we take news out of uh, today's world and we put it into context. And so, and I've asked Marvel to basically uh, take charge of this. So, Marvel, what do you have for us in uh, Gap News? Well, today we have a video that's talking about some craziness that happened this week in Washington. And I'm going to let uh, Michael Steele tell us all about it. Good evening from Washington. I'm Michael Steele in for Chris Hayes. There's a lot to get to tonight, including some really big developments in the many criminal investigations into Donald Trump. But I need to start with a question for today's Republican Party. What the hell's wrong with you? Today, House MAGA Republicans took an official party leadership sanctioned field trip to visit the January 6th insurrectionists, who they call political prisoners. This is just one step in um, you know, just exposing what's going on, um, making sure that we have the right information, and um, really listening to our constituents. We hear um, about the D.C. jail uh, regularly when we go back home, and the American people are very concerned uh, about some of the folks who are, um, who are here. Uh, so we're listening to them, and we're here on their behalf. Congresswoman Boebert, I hate to break it to you, but you don't have the right information. If you think the American people want you to waste your energy on the violent insurrectionist mob. In fact, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know her, the ringleader of today's circus, heard that message loud and clear from one protester who obviously wasn't a fan of her stunt. We have to work as hard as possible to defund the two-tiered injustice system. And we have to return freedom and due, due process rights to these pre-trial January 6 defendants. And as you can see, there's paid protesters here today, and they can whistle and say everything.
everything they want, but we will not be deterred. We do not care about them because they work for evil. I'm getting me a whistle. I'm getting me a whistle. <laughs> I'll talk to one of the Democrats who joined along on that trip in just a moment to hear why he called his Republican colleagues conduct today, quote, shameful. But this whole sad pandering show of support for the insurrectionists comes from the top of the Republican Party. Just look at what House Speaker Kevin McCarthy was doing yesterday. He met with the mother of Ashley Babbitt, the insurrectionist who sadly lost her life while she was doing Donald Trump's warped bidding on January 6th. Mr. Speaker, why don't, are you having a meeting today with Ashley Babbitt's mother? Can you talk to us about that? She requested a meeting. And what do you plan to talk to her about? She requested a meeting. But that McCarthy is one smooth operator. Oh, yes, because while Trump was distracted by the little stunt with the insurrectionist and placated by McCarthy's meeting with Babbitt's mother, the speaker used a little sleight of hand to deliver a huge gift to Trump's chief 2024 rival, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Now, you see, I know a thing or two about Republican politics and how it works. And I know for a fact that some of the party's big donors, at least the ones who aren't fully Trumpified, are trying their best to help Ron DeSantis by elevating his legislative agenda into the unofficial party platform. And just today, while everyone was distracted by the MAGA circus at the D.C. jail, guess what Kevin was doing? He pushed through a national version of DeSantis's signature so-called parental rights bill, right into the House. You know, uh, the Republicans put out our commitment to America. And in our commitment to America, we said we were going to have a parent's bill of rights. This is exactly what we just passed on the floor today. We're keeping our commitment. It's just another check off on all what we said we would do. This is not about Washington. This is empowering the parents. This is the parent's bill of rights. And Democrats wasted no time pointing out how draconian they think the McCarthy-DeSantis bill really is. Today, extreme MAGA Republicans passed a bill that puts politics over parents and will ban books, censor librarians, and bully children. It's shameful. The extreme MAGA Republicans want to jam their right-wing ideology down the throats of students, teachers, and parents throughout America. Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez may have put it best when she pointed out a specific book that was removed from Florida libraries under Ron DeSantis. I think what we're seeing here today is the Republicans' attempt, Republican Party's attempt, to take some of the most heinous legislation that we are seeing passed on the state level to attack our trans and LGBT, as well as people from marginalized communities, right to exist in schools. Let's just look at the impacts of similar Republican legislation that has already passed on the state level. Look at these books that have already been banned due to Republican measures. The Life of Rosa Parks. This apparently is too woke by the Republican Party. Really, Ron? You don't want kids to learn about Rosa Parks, the civil rights icon, an American hero? Well, who do you and Republicans like you think little kids should be reading about instead? Everyone knows my husband, Ron DeSantis, is endorsed by President Trump, but he's also an amazing dad. Ron loves playing with the kids. Build the wall. He reads stories. Then Mr. Trump said, you're fired. I love that part. He's teaching Madison to talk. Make America great again. And there it is, the modern Republican Party in a nutshell, reading MAGA BS to your kids while taking Rosa Parks out of our schools and libraries. That's the future Ron DeSantis wants for your kids, my kids, and our country. And apparently, Republicans in the House are more than happy to help him. So what do you think about that, people? I really want to hear your opinions about that whole thing. 
First of all, why would they go to the D.C. jail and pump up insurrectionists? And there were other stories that talked about, you know, if you wanted to talk about conditions in jail, you wouldn't be talking about these people who have, they literally have tablets for 22 hours a day. The only time they don't have them is when they're being charged. So they can text and FaceTime or whatever with their families all day long. They can do research on their cases. They have all of that available to them. They're staying in single cells, air-conditioned jails, air-conditioned. Now, we talk about black and brown people that are in jail uh, across the country, and what kind of conditions do they have? I really want to know what our audience has to say about it. But then, what do you have to say about it, Art? Well, I think that, um, as I indicated previously, that, uh, you know, we're in spiritual warfare. And um, when we get to this level of the uh, of the uh, uh, politics in the, on the national scale, even on the, even on the local scale, whatever, you're seeing that play out. The spiritual warfare and um, twisting, twisting um, truths and throwing things at you, such as, such as the word justice. We talked about Micah six eight, but what some people don't understand is justice also uh, includes punishment for your actions. What's the justice that you should have when you do something wrong? And now in the Bible, it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, pretty clear. Um, you do certain things, then you deserve death. That's that's justice. And here we have people who violated the law, and justice was enacted upon them, and they uh, ended up in in incarcerated. That's justice. That's where they should be. And so, um, when you fight against what, what 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 is supposed to happen, you're only fighting against God. Really, God God is the one that has placed them where they're at. And the justice that has been meted out to them is the justice that we're talking about in do justice. And then there's mercy because they've already received the mercy. What? I mean, they in jail for a number of months and all that kind of thing when the maximum sentence could have been 20 years, whatever. So they've received justice. And even if, even if, the Marjorie Taylor Greens and all those who went down to that uh, courthouse were uh, were right about what they were doing. They weren't doing it for God. They're doing it for themselves. That's the that's the fo uh, folly of politics. So yeah, I think I think we're seeing it play out right in front of us. The spiritual warfare that uh, that we talk about every day. Just to point it out really clearly. At one point, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's standing up there doing evil and promoting evil and uh, lifting up the evil of the insurrectionists, uh, had the nerve to say that the person that was blowing the whistle was the evil one. Mm -hmm. Eve warfare. That's what the, that's warfare, spiritual warfare uh, being played out in our lives every day. And understand, I'm not a I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm an independent person. I I make my choices based upon the Word of God, and and not what the leaders of the Democratic Party say, or what the leaders of the Republican Party say, or those who call themselves independent leaders either. And that and I think that's where you should be, and that's where we in this Christian education we teach you, uh, uh, we educate, and. Um, hopefully you take all that in. We give you the information you need and hopefully you make the right decision based upon the eternal word of God. Yes, yeah, Sister Michelle said, really <coughs> what it is is we just need you right now, Jesus. Oh, absolutely. In the name of your precious uh, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. When all this is going on, you better have, you better be holding on to the rock because they're trying to pull you this way. They're trying to pull you that way. And both pulling on each side of it, they pull you apart. <laughs> so, and so we have to keep that in mind. Well, I thank you, uh, Marvel, for that uh, gap news. Uh, keep us grounded in uh, what's happening today. And as we reach back 
to the Word of God to find out what God wants, of, what God expects of us. All right. Hey, we have um, gotten into this uh, part of this study, Constitution of the Bible, that we call the Manifest Destiny. The Manifest Destiny. And just so that we understand what is that, we, we, we've been brainwashed since we've been uh, able to understand the whole this this uh, system here has 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 taken hold of us and crammed stuff into us where by by uh, to control us and all that and to thinking things that aren't true and right and all that one of that is the manifest destiny which is as you can see in this famous painting here uh, this is uh, the United States supposedly you know some interpreters say this lady who's floating above all the uh, uh, what's happening underneath her and in the background is the United States. She's dressed up almost like you would see, you see pictures in the old, uh, uh, old, old pictures of, of, of uh, angels and, and all that. And in her hand, I guess, is supposed to be the Constitution. She's going westward. She's going westward, y'all. And uh, what that means, and you look at, the, at uh, what's behind her and under her, you see stagecoaches, you see covered wagons, you see Indians, you see cowboys. And uh, settlers and all that, and they're all moving westward. Why? Because according to the United States, they have a manifest destiny to spread all over this country from sea to shining sea, a uh, country that um, they they came upon and they they didn't uh, it, it wasn't theirs. They just took it, and they kept taking it, moving westward and taking it and taking it and taking it. And as we've talked about. How do you take land that that's not yours? If 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 you take something that's not yours, what do we call that? Stealing. <laughs> we call it stealing. And then they they try to impress upon us that it's right to do it because God gave us the right to do it. And as we've all been taught. probably heard that at some point in time in your life when you were little little kids right because that's that that's that's when they uh, uh put that in in front of us and teach us about it and make us sing it so that we know it right all, all we have to do to really know something is sing it and after that becomes a part of us so what they want you to to know uh is that this land the united states is your land it's my land wait wait a minute it was their land <laughs> when did it become our land? How did it become our land? And remember Micah 6, 8, you know? Do justice. Do you, is it right to just steal the land? To to uh, kill those who are in the land or, or move them out the way and put them on the worst uh, part of the country and tell them to survive there while we take over the rest of your land? I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, every time I, I, I review Micah 6, 8, that tells me something's wrong. Something's wrong. So that's what we're talking about. Manifest destiny. Did the United States have uh, uh, the manifest destiny from God to, to uh, steal somebody's property? And to kill them if they didn't want to get out the way? What is, what's that all about? Doesn't adhere to Micah 6, 8, I can tell you that. Now, what we've been talking about, uh, just, just just a little history. Some people don't like history, but you have to understand the facts that that have been laid out in front of us to understand why we are where we are. And what this is is a um, a map of the United States after the after the Revolutionary War. The United States prior to the Revolutionary War was a bunch of uh, colonies who thought each of them were sovereign uh, countries themselves on the uh, Atlantic coast. And then after the war, we were able to spread all the way over to the uh, Mississippi River. Mississippi River, that was that was the boundary. And if you look above, the British still had mostly what is Canada, and the Spanish owned everything to the west of the uh, 
Mississippi River. They, they had huge territories going down into uh, uh, Mexico and in Central, what we call Central America, even down into South America. They had huge uh, land that, that, that they discovered. Uh, <laughs> if you remember, they, they, they felt they had the right to uh, claim this property as their own, meaning this land as their own. Why? Because they discovered it. They discovered something that wasn't lost. Have you ever seen anybody like uh, you walk around and you fumble in your pocket and you drop a dollar bill on the ground and then a person come behind you and pick it up and say, ah, look what I found, and you still standing there. <laughs> <laughs> you say, wait a minute. <laughs> it's not lost. That's mine. Oh, no. I found it. It's mine. Now, that's the same concept that the Europeans had when they came over here. So, uh, they came over here, and now there's uh, the land from the Atlantic coast over to the Mississippi belongs to America, and everything to the west belongs to Spanish. Everything to the north belongs to the British. There's a, there's, uh, unfortunately, there's a problem. There's a problem because there are people there. There are people there in this land that you claim now is yours, whether you're Spanish, American, or British, there are people there. And each of those countries had to deal with the indigenous people that was there. And the question is, how did they deal with them? And here we come with the shadow of Micah 6.8. How did they deal with them? Did they deal with them justly? Did they show mercy? And were they walking humbly with their God? Now, understand that uh, the, uh, the British prior to the uh, Revolutionary War, prohibited those uh, American colonists and settlers to go past the Allegheny Mountains into that area that we call uh, now, we call it East, <laughs> because because we spread our way West, but uh, whether it was uh, down into what we know, those states that are down there in the, uh, over by the Mississippi River, what is it, Louisiana and Missouri and all those, uh, they weren't supposed to go over there. Why? Because there were people there. <laughs> and you can't just, you can't just uh, push them out of the way. And plus, understand, those people weren't just standing there saying, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving on out of your way because you are, you have white uh, privilege and all that. And if you want, and <laughs> I always laugh, do you want to know where, uh, 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 how far white privilege goes back? I mean, isn't that white privilege to think you can come over here and steal somebody's property and uh, kick them out the way and all that kind of stuff because you own it now? Hmm. All right. Um, look at the top of this. Uh, new new United States after the Revolutionary War up by the Great Lakes. And you see that little line that goes over there from the Mississippi River that kind of goes east? That's the Ohio River. And so... Uh, even back then, the important parts of the um, of, of the country uh, even dealt with Ohio River and the uh, Mississippi River. But if you look to the north of that uh, Ohio River, what you find is something that they call the Northwest Passage up by the Great Lakes, and all. that would include Ohio, what, what we now know as Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin. And you say, so what's the uh, What's so good about that? Well, now that now that the Americans have won the Revolutionary War, the British no longer uh, had any power to tell them don't go past the Allegheny. So what did the Americans do? They flooded past the Allegheny and started settling in those areas. And they wanted to settle what they call the Northwest Passage, which we know now as Ohio and Michigan and Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. Settle into an area that is uh, dominated by a people a proud people, as a matter of fact, who've been in this 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 land for uh, long before the Europeans got there, and so you're gonna have problems. They're not see what the United States have done is they made treaties with them, kept pushing them, pushing them further west, making treaties with them and breaking every treaty that they ever made. We know that doesn't comply with Micah six eight, the Word of God. So the problem is that the land is occupied. There are people, what do you do with the people who are already there? 
Now, this was an opportunity for America, which called itself a Christian country, which, um, as, as we know, for some reason, didn't look at Micah 6, 8 at all. I, I make the statement that they must have torn that, that page out the Bible and left it over in the old country as they proceeded to do whatever they wanted to do, not what God wanted them to do, whatever they wanted to do in this country or in this land. And so they still had the problem. By doing it, they came smack up against the problem, which is that there are people there. Hmm. And then what happened after that, and this is a review, is that uh, Thomas Jefferson back in 1801, 1802, <laughs> bought what we call the Louisiana Purchase whereby we didn't have to fight for all this land that we just added to the United States on the west side of the Mississippi River. We just purchased it from someone who didn't own it. <laughs> Isn't that something? And, and, and please go into the background a little bit, because what we were trying to buy was Louisiana. Really, well, we were, New Orleans. We were trying to buy New Orleans. New Orleans. But uh, Napoleon had a problem. Yeah, Napoleon's problem was that he's all the way over there in France fighting wars on the continent, and uh, he couldn't uh, really defend all this, and he needed money to fight those wars. The United States wanted to have some access to the uh, port of Louisiana because of the Mississippi River, that superhighway they called the Mississippi River. So they sent some delegates over there to talk to Napoleon in France about uh, can we purchase New Orleans and for $10 million. And Napoleon said, I'll do you one better. Because, you see, we just lost a uh, colony over there, in uh, which we call Haiti, to some uh, black revolutionaries, some slaves that wanted to be free, so they kicked us out of there, and we need to, we, we tried to go back over there and get it back, but they kicked our butt again and sent us back home. And if we can't even defend Haiti, then it's going to take a whole lot to defend this area here, over here in the United States. So instead of just purchasing uh, New Orleans, why don't you just purchase the entire Louisiana, what we call Louisiana, which, as you see in the white there, was a huge area. And I can it see was it. almost doubling the land mass. Mm -hmm. you know, Linda so, said that's incredible. So the United States was going to buy, they were going to buy New Orleans for $10 million, And Napoleon said, hey, I'll give you all of this for 15 I need some money. The United States said, uh, okay, you got it. So now the United States claimed from the Atlantic all the way over to the edge of this white area, which is double the size of the United States. But once again, there's a problem. <laughs> There's, food, there's people in this area. Did they ask the people who actually uh, possess the land whether or not uh, we can buy it from you? And, you know, we, we gave him $15 million, so we want to give you some and all that so we can. Uh, no, 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 we don't have to because this is our land now. We bought it. Now, that's different than what the Europeans did when they came over to uh, sell the ocean blue and all that and came over to the United States and planted their flag there. They say, we discovered this property or this land, so it's ours. The United States didn't discover the Louisiana Purchase, okay, that area. <laughs> that was, they knew about it. France, if anybody uh, had the right of discovery, it was the Spanish, you know. And then the Spanish uh, were having problems, so they they gave it to the French. who And, and within months of giving it to the French, the uh, Napoleon sold it to us. And so, so... But that's a problem. Now here comes Micah six eight two. You okay? You got all this land now, uh, all the way over to uh, the edge here of uh, Wyoming, and and it's great. I like this map because it superimposes what was carved out of this this uh, Louisiana Purchase states: Arkansas, Oklahoma, Mississippi, or uh, Missouri, Mississippi too, uh, Kansas, all the way Nebraska, Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota. Parts of Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, et cetera, et cetera. Whew. That's a large part of the United States. That's a a lot of that too is, is red. Red uh, instead of blue. Anyway, 
that was that was part of the Louisiana Purchase. <laughs> so, so now we have all that, and we got a problem. Michael six eight is is whispering in our ear how we should deal with the people that are there, and we never brought that over from the old country, so we don't know what Michael six eight said. We just took it. We just took it. Now, <sighs> so of course, America, the Americans, what they did as they were flowing into that area past the Alleghenies into the Northwest Passage and all that, they say, oh, we got some more land now that we can uh, settle. So they start pouring over into that area and fighting with the people who are there and all that because of uh, we have what's called a manifest destiny to control this uh, 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 continent. And God has given us this property. God didn't give you that property. Nobody gave it till you stole it. <laughs> Sister Monica, it's good to have Sister Monica back with us. She said, it's becoming clear. Uh, our history is not the truth. And, and and understand what they're doing today with trying to tell you what books you can have in school and all that, because they only want you to know certain things. They, they, don't, they don't teach us this as we're coming through school. They, 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 they uh, uh, stand on this manifest destiny. I remember that part when I was coming through manifest uh -huh. destiny. They taught us it, that. It was our destiny by God to just come on over this land and all that. And of course, we young kids and all that, we, we just take it in. Okay, manifest destiny. And there are people there, we, 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 we need to beat them and kill them and move them out right. of the way. Let's root for the cowboys. So, the settlers. Problem. That's a problem. And whether they want to accept it as a problem or whatever. You see, when you, when, when you start out with a mess and then you don't correct the mess and you just build on the mess and on the mess, the mess doesn't go away. It, it, it taints the entire process as you're building it and moving along through the years as, as United States uh, uh, spread into this area. Uh, it was a mess when you started. It was a mess as you're moving through it. And understand, even up to the day, it's still a mess. Why? Because we never corrected it. It's the same way with slavery. It was a mess when it started. It was a mess as it perpetuated. It, it resulted in a civil war. And as we talked about the long shadow of slavery that is still with us today, it has never been corrected. And until it's corrected, it's always going to be a mess. Always going to be a mess. Okay, all right. Problem. So the question is, what the United States had to confront the the question of what do you do with the people who are living in the land that you want to settle? Like a six eight is the way they should have gone. What is and 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 let's stop and think about this. What is justice in this situation where? Where, where we now claim to have all this property and all these people were here. What is the, would, would, would justice have been to try to work with these people, to uh, uh, fairly deal with these people? And maybe, maybe uh, I mean, they were agreeable to, to treaties and all that, fair treaties that allow them to live, allow us to live, allow them to prosper, allow us to prosper. That probably would have been uh, more justice than... Uh, than, than, than the way it turned out, obviously. And the love mercy. I mean, would we deal with them by killing them? That's not mercy. Would we deal with them by by uh, taking all that they have? That's not mercy. Or, or would we just take them and put them into an area that is barren and, and unproductive and all that? Say, now this this uh, piece of crap land is your land. You know? You stay there and you do whatever you want to do there. We won't bother you. Then... They find gold in that area, and now, oh, it's not yours anymore. It's now ours again. I mean, this, 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 this is a mess. Our country, you know what? I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I, I love America. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't love the history of it. And we're going to get to a point in this study where we're going to say, okay, we have it now. Look at America. Do the ends justify the means? You know, um... Uh, two things I just want to interject here. 
after visiting a third world country like we did last week, the Philippines. I, I really love America. I, I'm I'm we're blessed to be here. We're blessed to be living in this place. But we cannot overlook the history. We cannot overlook how this came to be. And we cannot stop advocating for justice and mercy, as it says in Micah 6-8, because the white privilege that was underlying all of this in the beginning is still pervasive in this country. Absolutely is. And it's, like I said, I mean, if you haven't corrected the mess, you still have a mess. And so, there's this problem. The United States and the has. Micah 6, 8 tells us how we should do it. And then walk humbly with our God. Remember, walking humbly with God means that you're doing what you're doing for the honor of God, not for the honor of yourself. So as America says, hey, we have the manifest destiny to take all over this land and do whatever we want to do with the people here, that's not walking humbly with God. They're doing it for themselves. Don't tell me you're doing that for God. Not buying it. All right. They have a problem, and the United States knew it, and they even put a, put a, a title on it. Say, what's the problem? It's the Indian problem. And we have a video for you to watch. By the early 19th century, the U.S. was rapidly growing both in size and power. Land hungry and ambitious, the new country was also drastically changing its policies towards the Indian nations. And nowhere was this more evident than in the treaties. The United States' primary interest in treaty making was to acquire Indian land. And so the treaties were used for that purpose, especially as the United States found itself in a position to pretty much dictate the terms of the treaty. And so the treaties morphed from this friendship and reciprocity sort of relationship into a very one-sided thing. There's almost a mythology about this that somehow when the pilgrims arrived, they were dragging land behind them. <laughs> There was no land brought here. The land here was Native Nations. And this is what the United States needed. It's what it wanted. They wanted all of it. They wanted everything. The greed came in. Well, we have a little tract here now. Now we need a little more. And well, we need to go make another treaty. We didn't understand that eventually those treaty-making processes ended up to the acquisition of all of our ancestral homeland. That land was a part of us. That land helped us be. That land was who we were and who we are. The command of removal came unexpectedly upon most of us. There was a time that we noticed several overloaded wagons were passing our home, yet we did not grasp the meaning. Then one day, wagons stopped. We were to be taken away and leave our homes, never to return. To get what they wanted, U.S. officials brokered treaties through any means available. Their tactics were so corrupt that the once trusted treaties became quickly known as bad paper. There were people at these treaty negotiations who would do anything to get an agreement on the table. And so there was very routinely bribery, individual payments made to tribal leaders, uh, alcohol would be used to put people in, a, in an agreeable frame of mind, and even coercion to say to people, you must sign this agreement or else. Every means of trickery and fraud was employed against Native nations. The United States would appoint a false leadership 
people who had no right to speak for the tribe and say, you're the leader of this tribe, sign this paper giving away all your land. As the century progressed, the treaties became more and more lopsided, a far cry from the parallel paths of the Gaswenta. Despite appeals from the Indian nations, the U.S. kept on its new trajectory, rationalizing its aggressive actions along the way. They have neither the intelligence, the industry, the moral habits, nor the desire of improvement. The tribes of Indians inhabiting this country were fierce savages. To leave them in possession of their country was to leave the country a wilderness. It's important in the great American mythology to describe the Americas as wilderness. Because if it's wilderness, then there's really nobody to dispossess. It was okay to come here and prosper and conveniently forget that there were already people and civilizations in place. At first we had something to eat, but that gave out and we were starving. We came to a slippery elm tree and ate the bark of that. Lots took sick and died. As Americans successfully pushed the bounds of the frontier, they not only believed that they were destined to take over the land and prosper, they believed that God was the one who put them there to do it. They believed that it was God's will, that the United States should be a continental nation stretching from the Atlantic to the Pacific. As each wave of immigration would come, they'd move into an area. The United States would then make some sort of arrangement with the tribe to get that land from them. And then more would come, and they'd advance the frontier even further. The power of manifest destiny, of expansion, of inevitability, of God's providence helped to rally people around not only the idea of Americans as entitled to North America, but rallied them around the idea that Indian people were barriers to civilization and barriers to progress. No matter how many treaties were signed or how much land they gave to the United States, the Indian was still in the way. This was known as the Indian problem. This so-called problem continued despite a decades-old policy to force Indians to swap their land east of the Mississippi for land west of it. The Indians would then move to those western parts and away from the Americans. This plan was simply called removal. The Removal Act was the centerpiece of Andrew Jackson's political agenda and was very controversial at the time. It was very widely debated. There was lots of discussion across the country and very many prominent people spoke up against it. Will the American government steal? Will it lie? Will it kill? I have no desire to see the poor remnants of a once powerful people. The removal bill represents oppression with a vengeance. The removal process, it was, all right, you've made these treaties. Now, you can have one of two things. You can keep your sovereignty, but you can't keep your land. But if you keep your land, then you have to assimilate and no longer be Indian. You will have sovereignty or you have your land. You can't have both. Across the United States, the Removal Act divided the country. But across the Indian nations, reaction was unanimous. We are surrounded by white people, and there are encroachments made. What assurances have we that similar ones will not be made on us should we remove to the Mississippi? Look here, Father. Our lands belong to us. We shall keep them. We do not wish to talk to you anymore. We had already been fighting to keep that land. And sure enough, when the government was coming in there to take us out of that land, we fought even more. But at some point, you have to realize that this fighting is all gonna be about death. And death is coming. Then I need to be protecting my family and I want my children to survive. So we have to endure this removal. Many of the tribes did choose to accept removal 
as a means of maintaining the tribal nation. What choice was there? After decades of engagement, they could no longer resist. And so they gave up their lands, they gave up their homes, they gave up their fields and forests, they gave up literally their way of life in order to be able to stay together and be what they were. We are poor, but we are free. No white man controls our footsteps. Some try to assimilate to avoid removal. Some were removed completely. But in the end, every nation met the same fate. Every nation had to give up land. Brothers, you cannot remain where you are now. You have but one remedy within your reach, and that is to remove to the West. May the Great Spirit teach you how to choose. The loss of land was devastating and so was the loss of lives. The most famous of these incidents was the Cherokee Nation's Trail of Tears, but there were numerous other trails just as violent and just as crushing. Everyone had to walk. My baby brother, Joel, was four years old. I was just eight, but I took my turn at carrying him because he could not walk much. I would get so tired, I'd think I was going to die but I would hang on to him. I was so afraid they would kill him. I saw them kill babies who were too big to be carried and would give out. That really was a road of death. People were falling on the side of the road or being shot or being murdered on the road and being left there. The removal process was done in a way that was not efficient in making people survive. Of the millions of Indian people that lived before the first colonists arrived, by the end of the 19th century, only 250,000 remained. The removal of a tribe was certain to destroy all of the things they knew about taking care of themselves, all of their medicines, all of their foods. Everything about them had to change in order to survive. It can only be understood as an act of destruction. When you move a people from one place to another, when you displace people, when you wrench people from their homelands, wasn't that genocide? We don't make the case that there was genocide. We know there was, yet here we are. When we were forced to leave our land, we took the fires with us. We took the embers along. Then when we got to Oklahoma, we rekindled the old fire. Old home or new home, it is the same fire. and you know, I do this research for this study <clears throat> but sometimes you run across uh, things that bring tears to your eyes the way that they were treated and I call this uh, I didn't call it, they called it the Indian problem was a problem that they had to deal with and they deal, dealt with it shamefully shamefully they <coughs> I mean even to the extent where they said okay we're going to sit down with you and we're going to make a treaty, meaning an agreement. And uh, this is going to work out good for both parties. But see, it was based on a foundation of you don't have any rights to this property, to this land. We're going to take the land. There was no discussion about that, you know. So uh, what kind of agreement is it? The agreement is that we take the land, you move out of the land and give it to us. We'll, we'll be gracious enough to allow you a certain area that we're going to call Indian Territory. We don't want to have a name for it. It's just Indian Territory. That's what, meaning that's where you, you are going to be. The Indian problem was not dealt with. 
according to Micah 6, 8? What was the justice in the way we dealt with it? What was the mercy? What was walking humbly or honoring God in this situation? What did America do? They took the land by force or by treaty. We talked about the Northwest Passage. They, they conquered that. Fallen, remember we talked about the Battle of Fallen Timbers? And um, Mad Anthony Wayne and uh, William Henry Harrison and all that, they just conquered those nations up there. Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, and all that. Forced them out by force. Or we did it by treaty. And then what did we do? We broke the treaty. We broke every treaty. Then, then we said, look, if you're not going to just move, then... You're going to have to assimilate, meaning you Indians are going to have to become like white people. And uh, if you want to stay here, because we're, we're coming. We're, we're going to be here. You either leave or you assimilate. And then some of the tribes, what they call the five civilized tribes there in the southeast uh, America, Seminoles and, and all them, they, they tried to assimilate. Okay, we're going to change like you. We're going to have a constitution. We're going to dress up like you. We're going we're gonna to have a, a laws like you and all that. <coughs> so we're doing what you want because we want to stay here. And what did America do? We changed our minds. We changed our minds. I, I know you. Uh, we told you to assimilate and you are assimilating, but we just want you out of here. We, we, you got to go. But see, these people have become like, like, like the white people. And they're telling them, you move from this land that you've lived on and, 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 and that has supported you, and now you're assimilating like us and all that, well, we'll rip you up out of here and throw you over in the Indian, Indian territory where there's nothing. Where there's nothing. We evicted them from their land, forced them to travel on foot and all that over a thousand miles to this Indian territory, and allowed them a lot of them to die on the on the way, even killed some of them. We replanted them into an area that they weren't familiar with, with little or no resources. We definitely, definitely did not act for the honor of God, but the United States acted for its own honor. That one gentleman said it, then the greed came in. Then they talked a little bit about this Indian Removal Act because <coughs> remember that was that was uh, up to that point they were asking assimilation and then they said oh, this ain't working let's just get them up out of here and it, the Indian Removal Act was a law passed by the Congress that became law that the executive branch the presidents had the power to enforce and when you look at this law that was passed when you read the words of the law, it said that it gives you the right to negotiate with these tribes for their property. It didn't actually say you had the right to remove them. But now this law is in the hands of the executive, and at this time it was in the hands of two of the worst presidents that we've ever had. Who was that? Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren. Now they teach us about presidents, and they have President's Day and all that. Were we supposed to honor presidents? A lot of presidents were scoundrels. As we've seen recently, scoundrels <laughs> in the office. But this Indian Removal Act, and I have a video on it, um, to give you some insight, because you got to know, you got to know what happened and what's, why we are where we are. Are you ready for the video now? Ready for the video. Native Americans had lived on fertile farmlands stretching across the South for countless generations. However, President Andrew Jackson wanted those lands open for settlement to American farmers. How did Jackson go about doing this? During Andrew Jackson's second term, he pressured Congress to pass a bill that would authorize the purchase of Native American lands and require the five civilized tribes to move to lands west of the Mississippi River. The bill, known as the Indian Removal Act, would impact the Cherokee, Choctaw, 
Creek, Chickasaw, and Seminole nations. Congress established Indian Territory in present-day Oklahoma to provide an area for the resettlement of the tribes. Jackson, along with supporters of the law, such as John C. Calhoun, argued that the policy of assimilating the tribes into white society had failed. Jackson also insisted that the policy of Indian removal would protect the tribes from encroachment on their lands and potential extermination due to conflicts with American settlers. Jackson's removal policy did face strong opposition in Congress, but moves to block it failed by only a handful of votes. Congress authorized the Indian Removal Act in 1830 and President Jackson signed it into law. The bill gave Jackson the authority to make treaties with the tribes and use whatever force was necessary to carry out their displacement. To oversee the removal of the tribes, Congress created a new federal agency known as the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The Choctaw were the first tribes sent to Indian Territory. In Mississippi, the state legislature abolished the tribal government and forced several chiefs to sign a treaty agreeing to give up 7.5 million acres of land. The enforcement of the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit led to a disaster for the Choctaw people as they were forced to march to Indian Territory during the winter. Nearly one-fourth of the tribe died as a result of starvation, cold, or disease. The Chickasaw, who also lived in Mississippi, cooperated with the U.S. government and the Choctaw to carry out their removal. Rather than receiving land in Indian Territory, they settled in the new Choctaw Territory. They also purchased much of their own supplies and made the move voluntarily. As the Chickasaw were allowed to manage a great deal of their removal process, they faced a much less difficult journey. News of the suffering the Choctaw endured led to resistance from the remaining tribes. Federal troops were sent to stop a Creek Uprising in 1836 and thousands were forced to Indian Territory in chains. By 1837, more than 15,000 Creeks had arrived at Fort Gibson in Indian Territory. However, it is estimated that more than 3,000 did not survive. The Cherokee, considered the most assimilated of the five tribes, hoped to maintain their lands and avoid conflict by adopting the culture of the white man. For more than 30 years, Christian missionaries had lived amongst the Cherokee. Schools were established, and Cherokee children learned to read and write in English. Many Cherokee lived in the style of homes and wore the same clothing as the whites who lived in Georgia. The Cherokee also established their own constitution and published a newspaper in English. The efforts at assimilation did not protect the Cherokee. When gold was discovered on their land, their treaty rights and territorial boundaries were ignored. The state of Georgia began preparing for the tribe's removal and the Cherokees sued for the right to remain on their land. After the original court case, the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia was thrown out by the Supreme Court. A second case involving a Christian missionary named Samuel Wooster ruled that the Cherokee Nation was a distinct community and that the laws of Georgia held no force over them. Despite this decision, Georgia proceeded with its plans to remove the Cherokee. Chief Justice John Marshall had ruled in Wooster versus Georgia that only the federal government, not the states, had authority over the tribes. As chief executive, the responsibility of enforcing the court's decision fell upon Andrew Jackson. When Georgia ignored the ruling, Jackson reportedly said, John Marshall has made his decision, 
Now let him enforce it. The forced removal of the Cherokee began during the presidency of Martin Van Buren. In 1838, 7,000 soldiers, led by General Winfield Scott, began rounding up the Cherokee. Members of the tribe were forced into a winter march to Indian Territory. Many had no shoes or blankets, and the food provided by the U.S. government was rotten. Due to cold, starvation, and cholera, some 4,000 Cherokee perished. The 2,200-mile journey became known as the Trail of Tears. While the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Cherokee failed in their attempts to maintain their tribal lands, the Seminole were somewhat successful. When the tribe resisted removal, a second Seminole War began. U.S. troops were sent to put down Chief Osceola's resistance, but their efforts proved largely ineffective. Osceola was captured, and some 4,000 Seminole were moved, but most of the tribe remained in Florida, where their descendants live to this day. All right. Indian Removal Act. Okay. Um, two things. One, uh, Andrew Jackson was the one that pushed the law through. His vice president, who became president, Martin Van Buren, was the one who presided over the Trail of Tears. So, you know, I, I, I view them as two of the worst presidents we've ever had because no matter what positive things they did in their administration, it doesn't offset what they did to these uh, indigenous people. It, what they did cannot be justified. It was horrible then, and it's uh, horrible when we review it now, and there's no justification for it. White privilege, manifest destiny, that's a bunch of crap. Like that one lady said in the earlier uh, video, they never claimed it was genocide, but it was. It was genocide. Now, think about this. We're in today's world, we're, we're so upset with all the things that other countries are doing and all that. Um, we want to hold uh, Putin uh, liable and all that. And we issued a warrant for his arrest for genocide and all that. And, you know pumping uh, missiles into civilian areas and all that, that's that's against the rules of war, no matter how we shape it or whatever. When we look back at the uh, how the United States dealt with the indigenous people, it is and it was genocide. It was the killing of non-combatant civilians and all that. It would be proclaimed a war crime or, or a crime against humanity. No doubt. So so as we look at what they're doing today and we want to ignore what we've done in the in, in the past, think of Micah six eight again. Think of Micah six eight again. All right. I, I get passionate on this because remember what is happening within America at this time on their on their uh right hand, they got their arm around the the uh, necks of the black people as slaves and all that and the things they're doing to them. And at the same time, with their left hand, they're removing and killing Indians and all that. And all because we are the land of the free and the brave. We are, we are the shining light on the hill. Only way we're shining light on the hill is we ignore who we are. So... Now it becomes very obvious why some of these people want to make sure that the real history is never taught. You know, the, the, the woke history is never taught because it, uh, just as many of our people have said in our class today, this is a mess. God wasn't in it. This was not something that God would have approved. As a matter of fact, it was based on greed and white privilege. Exactly. 
We have to teach it. We have to teach it. And it's not, it's, it's, it, the, and the only reason that it's, it could be called woke is because we were asleep at one time to the history. And that was the plan. All right. Well, we're not going to hold you anymore on that. I think you got enough to think about um, for next week. Uh, are we going to be here next week? <laughs> uh, next week, we will not be here. We have a little quick trip we're making. Uh, so we will be resuming in two weeks. Uh, we'll put the uh, announcement up on Facebook and uh, make the adjustments, but um, we will not be here next week. But please tell your friends to review this class. This class is really um, eye-opening. It's really eye-opening. You know, between the gap news about the craziness, <laughs> like Michael Steele said, what are you thinking about? And this history of how white privilege has shaped our history and the terrible things that we've done to indigenous people and to black people uh, in this country, they are still casting a shadow on the United States of America today in 2023. Absolutely. All right. Well, um, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Uh, and excuse us for this traveling that we're doing, but at some point in time, I think everybody needs to to uh, have a little break and all that. And especially after what we learned today, I think I need a whole week to... Uh, <laughs> Just to recover. To recover and digest it from America the Beautiful. <laughs> all right. Um, um, Marvel, anything else before we uh, sign off here? No, nothing else. Uh, we're glad that uh, everybody was able to come in. We really appreciate your comments. Keep them coming on the chat. That that keeps it interesting, and we're able to share what you think and what you're saying. So we really appreciate that. So we're going to go ahead and uh, give us a prayer, sir. All righty. As, as always, we begin with a prayer, and after this, we definitely need to end with a prayer. <laughs> Our Father and our God, we want to thank you, Father, for opening our, our eyes and our, to, to the truth, Father, to the truth. Regardless of, of what that truth says, so long as it's the truth, we're going to be able to deal with it because we know you're still in charge, Father. We're not going to ignore, ignore what is happening. We're going to hold this country accountable for its, uh, its, its past. We're not going to let them forget it, Father. We're going to uh, show mercy even to those who have um, uh, justice and mercy, even to those who have done such horrible things, Father, and those who perpetuate the horrible things and want to keep doing these horrible things. We're going to hold them to your standard, Micah six eight, Father. We're going to hold them to your standard and and pray for them, of course, because we know we're in spiritual warfare, Father, and so now that we know the truth. We know what we need to pray for. We know what weapons we need and all that. We need the word of God. We need you, Father, in this. We ask for a hedge of protection around all of all of those who joined in on uh, live with us, all of those that will review this at a, at, a, at, a, at a different time. And we ask for a hedge of protection as we do our traveling, Father, and come back and once again delve into your eternal word. We ask for all this in your name and for your sake. Amen. Amen. Standing in the gap, standing for Jesus. Standing in the gap for family and friends. Standing in the gap, one love for all. So we all can make it in. Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Studying to show ourselves approved Rightly dividing the word of truth Increasing our faith Glorify our God Standing in the gap Standing for
for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Make it in Make it in Make it in Wanna hear him say good Good and faithful servant Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Wanna hear him say, good and good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, enter.